Spook. Yes. Are you ready for another season? Just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. Ah, uh, yes. Welcome back to the Collingwood Rant for 2019. I am Sly. And I am It's Just Another Day, Spook. Spook. Yes. Are you ready for another Collingwood season? I am fit, pumped, primed, ready to be primed, then pumped, fit, and ready to go yet again and watch another grand final loss. I just cannot see anything deflating that. 2018, I believe we lost the grand final Did we? in very close circumstances. I think That's, I read this in the paper. I might have seen a mention of it here and there. How have you recovered from that loss? I'll never recover. Over Macho Grande? I'll never be over this grand final loss. So you're still hurt, angry, disappointed, frustrated, wanting to kill, homicidal? Yeah, but I have um, tears of this. I have a 2018 tear. I have a 2011 tear. I have uh, well, I have lots of tears, really. Oh, supporting Collingwood is the it's world about of the tears. tears. It is painful. I'm really, you know, I had to do a little bit of research for the first episode. Oh, which episode would that be? This episode. Oh, good. So, it's between 8.16 and 8.17. And seeing any reference to the Eagles, I just seriously wanted to maim and destroy. Oh, come on, they weren't that bad a band. <sighs> they were a little bit of a pain as a football team, though. I couldn't, anyway, I couldn't watch any of their uh, JLT games. Let's... Not worry about the grand final loss. No, oh, that's just put it behind us. Just put it behind us. I'm As over it. We do. Apparently, we probably made a profit. Let's talk about what we've seen in the preseason. Yes. So, I believe we lost a practice game to Melbourne. Yeah, that's about it. It's a practice game. Yeah. Then we played two JLT games. We played Fremantle over in some place in West Australia at like three p.m. on forty eight degree day. Good fixturing AFL. That's intelligent. Uh, we beat them, and then we played Carlton in... Where was it? Morwell? Uh, yeah, Morwell, I think. Yep. It was Morwell. I'm mm. not just making that name up. In the open cut. Yep, and we beat them in a narrow victory. That's it. So, how the flag's did... ours to lose. <laughs> They're all ours to lose. <laughs> um, how did you feel about those two games? Well, um, did, look, they, did they give you any sense of belief in this season? Oh, no, I actually thought they weren't um, overall bad performances. The, the start to the throw one was rusty as all buggery, but, um, you know, they pegged it back and, and won comfortably. I mean, it's really nothing to read too much into these games, but um, I just want to win everything I see them play, so there's that side of things. The Carlton one was, you know, there was a whole lot of not caring in that last quarter, but they still managed to, to hold on, and maybe that's just an extension of that... Uh, Resilience from last year still showing through, but um, it was good to see some of the new boys run around. Um, I mean, I was actually I was... interested in both games. We actually had quite a few outs. So we had guys like... Oh, Goey. especially in the first one, you had that big list you sent me. Yeah, uh, that was the second one. Well, that was a shopping list. Yeah, it was the Goey, Hoskin Elliott... Uh... Wells. <laughs> Wells. Um, um, I don't think Wells played. Yeah, he didn't play. Uh, some of them, Adams didn't play. So that's three of you starting 18. Uh, and a number of other guys, like how didn't play in that Fremantle game, he did play in that Carlton mm-hmm. game. Mm-hmm. So they actually had about eight players out of each side. So they had a really young side. They had guys like Callum Brown, Tyler Brown, uh, Josh Murphy Bacos. Brown. Yeah, you know, all playing. Uh, I think he impressed me with both games. Oh, I didn't think he did impressions. I'm going to do one this year uh, to try and elevate our ratings. Uh, the thing that impressed me in both games was we really just sort of seemed to play tempo football. Mm. It was like, okay, this is the standard. All right, let's just play a bit better. If they lifted, as Carlton did against us about three times, it was just like, all right, let's lift and mm. counter. I mean, I think the Carlton game, they were a bit unlucky toward the end. You know, they were about two and a bit goals up or whatever they were. And side bottom got penalised for that ridiculous uh, deliberate where he, he grabbed the ball up. He was oh, basically on the line it. and he just stepped out. And the umpire said, well, that's deliberate. And that annoys the shit out of me because that's one of those ones where the umpire should just show some common sense. Sidebottom could have just stood his ground, gotten tackled and dragged over the line, but he just said, well, what's the point? So, you know, the ball's going to die here. Here. Just ball it up. For only 10 seconds of the season, you're already hating on the umpires. Because it's just that sort of really pedantic 
umpiring by the law rather than just sort of applying any context or common sense to it. It's umpiring by the law unless it's in the last dying minutes of a grand final. Uh, yeah, well, which grand final is that? Uh, is that a can of worms? <laughs> no, but it, it's just... I really... It annoys me, like, every year the AFL will jump up on something and you go, know, let's be really harsh on this. And it's like the hands in the back for a while was hot. And now they've gotten rid of it. So... In my opinion, by getting rid of it, you're actually admitting that you were just wrong for five, six years that you actually had the rule in. I mean, there is a rule called push in the back. So if you push someone, whether it's by hand, by forearm, by knee, by head, whatever it is, it should be in the back. Some of the commentators don't seem to know the rule themselves because they go, oh, it wasn't, he didn't use his hands and all that sort of shit. Uh, but these rules, they sort of bring in, like, um, it was Gary Rowan that had his leg broken. And then there was... So there's rule. a rule now for not breaking legs? Yes. There's that rule well, that you can't handy. slide into a uh, into a pack. Unless you're playing baseball. Yeah. That's sliding into a base. Ah. Uh, so they bring in these rules just because they're knee-jerk reactions to whatever's happening. I did see Gary Rowan's knee-jerk a bit in that uh, incident. <laughs> yeah, someone who's had a broken leg is not that funny. Um, but I'll laugh anyway. <laughs> yeah, but it just annoys me because it's just like knee-jerk reactions and are they improving the game? No. Are they confusing the hell out of everyone? Yes. You know, you have so many of these murky rules. That ruck one's just still. I, no one knows. How can you, for so long, have a rule where two ruckmen will go up, the umpire will blow a whistle and all the players will turn around and go, well, whose is it? No one actually knows. Not until the umpire, umpire goes, oh, well, I'll point one way. I've seen them flip coins. But it's ridiculous. It's like, well, surely... Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> If you fall in someone, or if a player falls in someone's back, you go, well, okay, well, I know where they've paid that. The ruck rule is just like, oh, hang on. We're going to call a block because you stood your ground. It's like, well, so you can't stand your ground in the ruck contest? Well, he only did it 10 times before. Oh, well, you know, I mean, Grundy got called for a few of those in the grand final. So oh, we're going there again, are we? If you never paid those previously, but now he's getting pinged for, like, going a little bit early than stopping. It's like, well, you know, they can jump. Opponents can sort of jump on the other guy. Anyway. Uh, but I really liked with both games, it was a tempo football. You know, they just played as hard as they needed to play to stay on top of the opposition. Uh, both teams are young. Fremantle and Carlton have young lists. Uh, so we had a relatively young side in both games too. But they're the sort of games that those young teams actually want to win because, you know, at some point their season just turns to shit, so they want to come out firing. Um, Carlton's got a lot of pressure on them. I mean, they got, you know, some really good young talent now, which is disappointing to see. So I think they wanted to make a bit of a statement. And in both games, we just smothered them. Mm, mm. You know, so I was actually really, yeah, the two practice games. So you can't take heaps out of it. But like, I was just, I just thought, I just want to see some cohesion there and some maturity. And, you know, I saw it. You know, you had these two young teams that we fielded and we actually won both games relatively comfortably. Uh, any other thoughts about... No, it was good to see uh, Darcy Moore and Elliot back and yep. uh, making it through games. Oh, well, how, how much did you have your... What's the term? Pinafore on? No. How, uh, were you biting your nails when Elliot limped off? Uh, only every time, but I don't think that'll last much more until 2028. Well, at least the guys, you know, Darcy's a potential superstar. Elliot is a gun. Uh, so hopefully we can keep them fit and on the field because... That's where they need to be. Yeah, you know, because they improve the side immeasurably and Darcy's got a lot of improvement ahead of him mm. as long as he stays fit. Very encouraging performances, though. And even, um, I didn't mind the look of Roughhead in the Carlton game, too. I thought he... Uh, Roughhead was really good. That, I think I texted... He could be pick up of the century, this one. <laughs> I texted you in the Fremantle game and I was thinking, geez, he had no presence, or he has no presence. But that Carlton game, he really started to show something. A few of the other guys, like how looked terrible. I think he grubbed every kick he had or he shanked it. It's like watching the grand final again. Um, <laughs> There's that word. Yeah. Callum Brown, like, he looked really good. Yeah, no, consistently good. Tyler Brown had a great uh, last quarter in the uh, yep. 3 game. So you think he's just got to put it on some size. Showing a little bit of uh, potential there. Josh Dacos showed a little bit there. Quainer uh, ran around a bit. So it was good. Quayle probably when he gets the tempo more because he has that tendency to like, um, I think you said this too, just once he gets the ball, it's just like, that's it, I'm out of here. I've got to run. Yeah, yeah I've got to run and kick it. Uh, once he gets a bit of composure, you know. He'd be better for the run. Yeah, so I think he'll win the Brown Lake this year. Um, he'll spend a few weeks at the VFL. I'll just actually say this as an aside. It's interesting now that the AFL are saying, let's look at this rule that's allowed Collingwood to get Quayle because his club shouldn't be able to hide and, you know, nail down top talent outside of the draft. So it's like, once Collingwood did it, it's like, oh, geez, we better look at it. 
Well, you know, didn't Sydney do this for about 100 years? Yeah, you know, for Isaac Heaney and all these guys, but that was okay. It's our special zone. Yeah. You can't walk into it. But It's once, our special zone. Once Collingwood did it, now it's the crime. That's it. Open slap. No. Anyway, uh, any final thoughts on the illustrious preseason? No, just win the fucking flag. Okay, you might hear that once or twice throughout, not just this rant, but every rant. Okay, we'll be right back with a special look at Collingwood culture. Does it have a degree in computer science? It has a comma, 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 chameleon. Oh, that's special. It comes and goes. So, welcome back. We are going to look, have a quick look at Collingwood culture because I had a lot of arguments with people in the off-season. Had like, it doesn't sound like you. No. You know, totally. I'm the most amenable guy you would know. Was there any toxic masculinity? I am nothing but toxic. I am... Yeah, might go there. <laughs> All right. Let me ask you this. What, how do you define success at a football club? Winning flags. So what about profits? Winning flags. What about training facilities? Winning flags. What about like really nice um, ground and administration offices? and? Yeah, now this is a very interesting one. Let me just think about this for a second. Winning flags. What about membership numbers? Who gives a fuck? Winning flags. All right. So, you won't qualify success with anything but winning flags. Isn't that what we're all about? Us or everyone? Well, it says the premiership's a cakewalk in the, uh, in, the in the blurb. It should be saying it. one in four premierships are cakewalks. One in four grand finals Decades. are cakewalks. Yeah. So, but do you see any other qualification of success in, at any football club? I see elements that contribute to the ultimate prize as a form of success, um, but the ultimate success is winning flags. Okay, so in the AFL era, which started in 1990, Collingwood won the first grand final. Oh, that's it. The first AFL grand final. We're done. They I did, hope you enjoyed this segment. They drew the qualifying final. I had to replay it. There, so, seems, there seems to be a theme in uh, what it takes to win a flag. So in the AFL era, you have four teams on one flag, and that's Port, Carlton, Richmond, West, Western Bulldogs. <laughs> Losers. Yeah. And then you have... Five teams on two flags, which is Sydney, North, Adelaide, Collingwood, and Essendon. <laughs> Losers. Hang on. Then you have three clubs on three flags, which is Geelong, West Coast, and Brisbane. And you have one club on five flags, which is Hawthorne. Now, the difference is, a lot of those clubs haven't played as many grand finals as we've played. As we've played. I don't think anyone has. No, I mean, in the AFL era. So, we played in 02. Well, in the era, really. No, we played in 02, we lost. We played in 03, we lost. We played in 010 twice, yeah. drew one. 010? Oh, yeah, 010. <laughs> 2010. Um, 010. Yep, yeah, to play 010. That's why I love the. <laughs> yeah. Uh, really? I would have thought you had more fun last year. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Do we make a profit? I don't know. Uh, but we played in 010, we won. 11, we lost. 18, we lost. So. Why don't you just give me a nice paper cut and pour lemon juice in it? I'll pour beer in it. So that's five grand finals, not counting the draw. You know, we've played in and we've won just the one. Is that it? Yeah. Surely not. So it's 2, 3, 10, 11, 18. That's 5. If you're going to count the draw, that's 6. We could have been Hawthorne if we won all this. Well, the thing is, I mean, I look at the grand finals we've lost and, you know... Oh, I'm glad you do. Well, I look at the <clears throat> psychology of them. Yeah, you know, too many people sort of say... Oh, my head, too many people say, oh, you know, we didn't have a gun team that year. You know, we were lucky to make it and all that sort of shit. You mean you aside know. from 010? Yeah, aside from 010, you know. And, people, and 011. You go back before, yeah, and 018. Um, you go back before the AFL era, like with those Hafey Grand Finals, and people go, oh, you know, we weren't good enough. We didn't have great teams. I mean, that sort of ignores the fact that in not in 77, we were up by five goals at three-quarter time. Were we? And we finished that season from memory on top, three games clear of everyone else. So we were the best team. I, mean, I know Carmen was out, but we were still five goals. The up. biggest and the best that's understood. Yeah, 79 were five goals up against Carlton at quarter time. There's a theme here. Um, 81 were 20 points up with about two minutes left in the last qu- uh, third quarter, sorry, and we gave up two goals. So, I mean, we've been in plenty of winning positions. You go back to 70, we were 44 points up at half time. Jeez. So I don't really care. I don't remember that one. Yeah, I don't really care, you know, what our squad was like that. Yeah, they were in winning positions. And it's like, once you're in there, you're a chance to win it. You know, and other teams have done it. But we don't seem to be able to snare the underdog victory outside of 1958. See, the, the football gods get nothing out of it if we win, though. Well, I guess not. I mean, I guess they get some laughter and all the other supporters 
get to get the hysteria of mirth and all that sort of shit. But I'm just sort of looking at them thinking, you know, if we can get there and if we can actually be in winning position, then surely we should be good enough to win, to, to steal one or two. I mean, my... Law of averages being what it is. Well, law of averages is kind of it's one in four, you know? So it's not a great return. And I think one of the things, I mean, we've talked about the grand final last year, but they really need a greater psychology as to like, when the game's online, they need players who are going to go, okay, I will win this for us. I think Goey tried. I think Adams tried. I think Cox tried. Three guys, I think, tried. You know, passengers though. You know, oh, look, I'm not going to single out names, but... Oh, go on. Well, you know, you look at someone like Crisp, who was magnificent in the preliminary final. All those run- He kicked two goals from half back. How many runs did you see him go on in the grand final and break lines? You know, how? How many Eagles players did he pick out? You know, Langdon played a good game, but also gave away three goals. That last goal was like he was laying on the ground. It was like, here, have the ball. I'm in no position to stop you. You know, so there was... It's like that 2010 documentary about the draw where they interviewed Nick Maxwell, who was captain. Now, Nick, Nick Maxwell was a serviceable player. No one's going to, you know, compare him up there with the greatest fullbacks and centre-half backs and all that. But he said that, you know, he could see they were going to lose it. And he said to himself, okay, if I get the chance, next time the ball comes my way, I'm going to try something. I'd rather lose trying something than just go down without trying anything. And he intercepted that uh, kick for St. went forward, took a mark, kicked it forward, and that was the goal that put us back in front. Or he kicked it and went from side bottom to Kaffa to Cloak, or the mm. doors to Cloak, and he put us back in front. And that's, the days. that's what you just sort of needed last year. You needed someone to go, you know, and the guy we tried, I mean, he played off in the boundary and all that he missed. Cox took a few good marks. Adams, you know, really in there and all that sort of stuff. But too many guys were just solid without yeah. being... And, you know, I believe you had some intel where... I won't mention names, but you were told that, you know, the coaching staff was a bit mystified that... Uh, after the first end of the first quarter or there, after the, that halftime, yeah. Yeah, that the, like... What they, had happened. Yeah, they'd just gone from being daring and running to really just being, you know... Uh, Stodgy and wary and protecting the lead. Yeah, I think we talked about that in yeah. the, uh, the grand final oh, sure. wrap-up. They Jeez. just uh, went to their shell, something shot. Yeah. But so in terms of culture, it's, you know, you want to have a culture which is going to, you know, sorry. A Hawthorne culture. Yeah, it's going to be basically a win-at-all-cost culture. A Hawthorne culture. Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying play dirty or cheat or anything like a that. A Hawthorne culture. Yeah. you got to play through the rules. But geez, you know, that's... do whatever it takes to win a flag. Yeah, you if, do... you have, if you have to belt eighteen blokes, then so do it. Well, we, within the rules and all that sort of stuff, but it's like it doesn't um, matter. You get five weeks off at the start of the season. You still. I just, I mean, Sidewinding got really tagged out of it. And from what I heard, he got like pummeled quite a bit. Whereas black and blue at the end of that game, uh, when we all, <laughs> well, you know, he felt it a bit more. But you know, surely you would have just said, oh, you know, Maynard, I'm going to play in the center for five minutes and just run through his tag. Give away a few frees if you need to, but just make him wary of what he's doing to side him. You know, make him start thinking. And Weagles really It's old learned, school hockey, though. Yeah. Weagles really learned from getting pummeled by Hawthorne a few years ago. It's like, play hard, play fast. You know, I sort of gone off in the grand final. Again? Yeah. That might happen a few times this year. <laughs> yeah. It's and next year? The and the year after? The horror. <laughs> uh, what else do you think about the Collingwood culture? in terms of moving forward, do you actually feel that we're building Jeez, look, something Look, I almost thought, and not wanting to harp on the grand final too much, but fuck, you know, if they won that one last year, that could have been the straw that broke that particular camel's back and we could have launched forward. We, we took one when we shouldn't have even deserved to probably be yeah. there. Um, we could have set up all the young kids for today that have just never experienced a win to, to launch them into that next um, um, period of Collingwood dominance. But we're now back behind the eight ball yet again. And um, this is the way that we roll. And we'll go and try and pump that adulation up and the wonder of it all. And we're making money and profits and all those other things that we tend to fall back on when we fail at the at the end. Not well, fail is probably a harsh word. Fucking fail. Um, but we're back to where we're used to being. And that's yeah. part of that problem, I think. I mean, I, I've got to give Buckley, Coach Nathan Buckley, credit. He's a coach. Apparently, um, let's see, about 13 years in now. Um, but the way he spoke at the Copeland was magnificent. Oh, definitely. I did. don't disagree with that. You know, and, and, and considering how raw and bitter everything was for, for me, to be impressed at that time was uh, was quite a feat. And I'll compare what he, the way he spoke to the way Alistair Clarkson spoke on two occasions, which 
in the 2011 prelim, which Hawthorne led for the bulk of the game and then they lost. Uh, and in the press conference, he just goes, we weren't ugly enough for long enough to win the game. You know, he goes, it's a good lesson for us. And then when they lost the 2012 grand final, I saw some of his speech from Hawthorne's official function where he just said, you know, we'll recover from this. This is not a tragedy. Don't look at this as a tragedy. And that was right around the time of the Jill Ma murder where he goes, you know, what's happened there? That's a tragedy. He goes, this is a game, you know, we've lost it, but we'll, we'll bounce back. And the way he spoke, like he didn't blame, as far as I know, he didn't blame anyone. You know, unlike, say, Mick Malthouse in 2003 when he started just, you know... Got Singling on, individuals yeah, out. You know, and that would have really fractured team morale. So the way Buckley spoke was magnificent. And he really just put the onus on, you weren't good enough for long enough to win that game. And he actually said, he goes, we lost a bit of our dare. That was his words, we lost a bit of our dare. So he actually saw that, I mean, you know, you know that they said that because you were told. Um, they lost that initiative to just sort of take the game on and win. See, I mean, and just getting back on what you were asking before, I mean, if you were talking culture at that particular divide moment, there's two ways that this list can go. It's they can either sit there and, 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 and be worshipped, like what they used to be doing, or they can burn about what they missed out on and become a stronger unit. You saw it with Geelong when they when they yeah. lost against Port. Um, Hawthorne. Yeah, Geelong, was, Geelong yeah. smashed Port by 20 goals. Oh, sorry, not Port. But, um, Hawthorne. Hawthorne. Yeah. Um, you see that with sides when they, when they do get... Busted in that in thing that they can they can use that as leverage to to, to move into a, a winning culture. I just hope that we just don't revert to form and and just think that wonderful is wonderful enough. There is something better than that that's out there, and your hands were this close to it. It's like the the Grail in uh, Indiana Jones. I thought you were saying Monty Python, the Holy Grail. Just there, then then it all falls into a yeah. crevice. I think the one positive. I mean, I'm sure there's a number of positives, but you know, like when you look at improvement, where's it going to come from? Obviously, like they got beams, you'll improve the side. Oh, it's, yeah, the list is you know, deep. but then they got guys <sighs> like the Goey, Stevenson, you know, even Maynard, who's been around for a while, but they're still really young. They're they're all on the improve. None of them, you know, on the other side of it, like Pendlebury, um, you know, he's like 31, so you expect him to take Robert. Although he was really good in the preseason, but um. So you're going to get a lot of improvement. Mason Cox is another one. You know, last year was his actual first real full season, mm. and he really showed quite a bit as the season went on. So he's going to get better. So you do have a number of players who are continually under improving, and then you have guys like Trelaw and Adams who should now be at the peak. Um, and then you have guys like Moore and all that, and Elliot who are coming in almost like new recruits. So there's a lot of sort of improvement from a lot of different facets and the thing that I would hope that guys like Trelaw I mean he spoke about it he just said how much you know he hasn't watched it it just burns him good and good that's, that's awesome you know I think you said how on some interview Jeremy Howe just said it you know he oh he was on yeah, he was right, always indifferent yeah, yeah. I mean maybe that was just the face he was putting on but I think you have a number of players there who are going to walk away and just sort of go I never want to feel that again Probably came to the wrong club, but, you know, just going to burn and want to improve and go one better, you know, and we'll use that as a driving force. I mean, I hope it's like Hawthorne in 2012 who lost and they won the next three, you know, and they really use that as the driving force. Uh, Lee Matthews realised that, he, you know, when he took over Brisbane and they won the first one in 01, they won the next two, unlike when he was at Collingwood, he obviously was still a new young coach at that time. He let us go off the rails and he really struggled to get us back on track. And then a lot of things just went wrong. So I'm hoping that right now with Buckley there, and Buckley, to me, I've always said he's very aware of the, I don't know what's the best way of putting it, the way the club smacks of shit at times in terms of the hype, you know, and the, and the unconditional love and adulation. It's, and it's great, you should support your club unconditionally and all that sort of stuff. But the way we talk about our club at times, or you know, the, the celebration that you see and you think you've done nothing, why are you celebrating to this extent? And I'll, and I'll give you an example. Like, people say, we're the greatest club of all. Based on what? Losing grand finals? Well, then we are. Are we in charge? Or are we leading the premiership tally? Not for a long time. Carlton Essen in front on 16. And like, I was speaking to someone and some, and the person just, oh, we don't cheat. I was like, I don't care. You know, they're in history books. You're not having those taken away. Uh, so, in the modern era, Hawthorne by far is the most successful club. Absolutely so. You know, and if you break down our premiership tally, it's I like, usually break down after that. Or we break down the grand final tally, but, you know, we've won two in the last 60 years. 
you know, and it's from about 12 attempts or something. You know, and a lot of those attempts, again, were in winning positions. So I don't give a shit what side, I don't, I don't care if you feel that the under 12s in those games, you're in winning positions, you could have taken it out. Because if you're good enough to get in winning positions, then surely you're good enough to actually see it through. And you must be good enough because, you know what? To get to that far, you are obviously winning enough games and you're winning important games. So, you know, it's that whole... Do the math, people. You know, it's that whole blind rationale that, you know what? We weren't good enough to... You know, the size we're feeling weren't good enough. It was just the honour to be there. And I hate that attitude. I seriously could strangle people who have that attitude. You mean like this? Yes, like... And this is interesting, so I was just trolling around on Twitter as I do. You troll. Yes, and I saw a tweet from the Collingwood Football Club Mm -hmm. had a picture of Eddie Maguire, and Eddie Maguire said, it was so exciting last year. It was probably the best year I've had at Collingwood. And in 2010, we won the Premiership. Do we need to say anything else? That's not what I want to be hearing. We'll be right back to look at our first game of the year. Oh, goody. Collingwood versus the Children of the Corn. Welcome to the match preview. It is Collingwood versus... Uh, The Geelong Handbaggers. That's just politically incorrect now. Uh, the Geelong uh, Pussycats. I'm sure someone will find something wrong with that. Um, okay, so I had a quick look at the list. And these are the guys who won't be playing. I believe. I don't know. That could surprise us. You won't be playing. I am a chance. Jordan the goey. He's back at full training, but obviously uh, they won't risk him. Don't know. You know, I don't know what the timetable is for these guys. Maybe he could come out like wearing a mask and he could burst through the banner and reveal himself like one of those superhero moments. Like DC, mate. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's a DC one, then he won't just run you know, through the brand, he'll destroy it <laughs> and lay waste all the cheer squad. And Anyway. Uh, That's a story for another time. Yeah. Daniel Wells. Oh, surely not. <laughs> What's the story with Wells? I don't, I don't know. He's, He's not very well. He hasn't appeared in VFL. He hasn't appeared in maybe, preseason games. Maybe he's like Kaiser Sozo. I won't go there. Um, Sam Murray. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably good. Yeah. Is that ever going to get resolved? I don't know. He's got the Essendon lawyer, so he'll get resolved in 2025. By which time he'll be retired in a wheelchair. What I guess will happen will be like, the they'll come out and they'll ban him for two years and go, you can't play and he'll retire, and then a year later, GWS or someone will go, look, we're on the rookie list in, we think the penalty was harsh, now if we go, well, it's not Collingwood, so we'll overturn that decision. And give him a brown low. Yep. Matthew Scharenberg. There's a shock. Lyndon Dunn. Full training, I believe, so okay, the so recovery's like, come, and, uh, come along well, apparently. So, but I can't imagine they're going to, you know, rush any of these guys back. Particular- no, not with Ruffy there. Right, well, I was going to say more, Could so... Could be a pick-up of the century, that one. Could be. Uh, ben Reid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, God love him. Did you ever used to watch the old Paul Hogan show, The Sketches? With Mac and Hoax. Yeah. And they did. he did the one of the Hulk, but it was the Incredible Weed. <laughs> anyway. Um, I, I, For our younger viewers out there. Yeah, it goes YouTube. That. <clears throat> the Ben Reid one's really sad because he was a really good player. Yeah, I didn't mean to laugh. Yeah. In, it was a bad thing. It's just funny. Yeah. Um... It's funny because I don't know. <laughs> Tim Broomhead. Oh, yeah. That was a blast from the past. As far as I know, Flynn Appleby's not playing. Uh, Braden Sire played in the VFL last year. Last year. Yeah, he, he also played this he last played week. played the pretty game in Melbourne. Yeah. He played the VFL, did he? Right, yeah. So. so, apparently has... Uh, That's a strange one, that one, because he was bloody good to, uh, last year. So well, Apparently, allegedly... He must he be carrying something. Really under bad or, flu or something. Well, what's Lyndon Dunk got to do with it? Oh, yeah. um, so I don't think they'll bring him back I mean Cullen Brown's probably done enough to actually carry his spot but it's going to depend on the other guys coming back Adams is also out yeah he's with the finger thing yep yeah. and Jeremy Howe played his first game 
last week, he played like a half, but seriously, off the back of what he showed, you'd be, I don't know, I, I wouldn't be playing him. Mm. He was really so far off the tempo that I actually think they need to take a lesson from what happened with Nick Maxwell in 2011. Maxwell was injured and they sort of brought him back before he was ready and just the whole season he really looked like he was always a couple of steps behind the pace and it would have been just better just go, you know what, take a month off, we'll bring you back to the reserves and, you know, and same with Didac was in the same position. So I'd rather they don't actually rush how, I'd, I'd rather they just said, let's do this slowly. You know, there's no grand finals in April for us to lose. There just... should be. Yeah. Well, how many do you want to lose in the season? I thought be all of them. <laughs> um, yeah. Cats could debut four youngsters. I would name them, but nobody cares. It's not the Geelong rant. Uh, that was one of uh, Sam Hamburger's uh, tweets. Yes, which you passed on to me. Mm-hmm. So what are your thoughts about this game? Oh, we'll smash it. Friday night, 7.50, back at the old spiritual home of our grand final losses. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think we've um, we've lost the opening games the last couple of years, so it'd be good to get with off one. the ground with a with a good um, run because I think the next month is is quite hairy, and then we've got a period of absolute dominance coming up. So, but you know, every win's gonna count, and I would love to open the season with a victory on Friday night. Yeah, so and I don't think it's uh, outside the realms of possibility. To be honest, I don't know about Geelong. They their J O T form, I think, was patchy. pretty good, but. Um, I don't know. There's always a hype around Geelong. Well, let's face it, they only play finals because of the 58 home games they played <laughs> yeah. in your park a year, and when they get there, they fall short. So I mean, the good thing about well, for Geelong is they have a pretty good top end. So when that fires... Yeah, they're all grandparents now. Oh, well, Danger Falls on like, what? 110? Yeah. And I don't know what their side is, but they had a few of... Uh, Oh, what's his name? Tim Kelly. He's pretty good. He was good. That Menegola was really good. I thought when he went out, that was when they Menegola. actually... He, that was when they started the struggle. And they were like two of the better... I mean, I think they were both mature age recruits, but like they were two of the better new guys they brought in. I mean, for about the last four or five years, they've brought in guys like Selwood, Scott Selwood, and the Scott, oh, one of the Selwoods. Um, Zach Smith and Zach Tui and... You know, all these guys Zach like Anderson. Anderson. <laughs> yeah. Well, Zach Efron would actually improve that. <laughs> so, I mean, they've recycled a lot of players, which I, to me have amounted like sort of deck chair shuffling. But none of those guys... On the Titanic. Yeah. Outside of um, Dangerfield's obviously a champion. Like all the other guys, I'm thinking, really? You got rid of that guy and brought in that guy. You might as well just stay with whoever you had or bring in the young guy. So, I don't know. I, I think they're you know as you said massive hunger and advantage that helps them with finals getting in the finals they didn't get in the finals last year did they I don't think they did they just missed out yeah Yeah. good thing Um, so I don't really think they're going to be a power or anything will they improve I don't know but are they still dangerous yes they'll start well I'll give them probably that but I think we'll pull them back and Dependence on, look, my concern sort of is a little bit about um, a lot of the success we had last year was on the back of all those injuries we had and bringing in a whole bunch of unknowns and everything just click well. I don't think we're going to go in with that same team for round one. There's going to be a whole bunch of better players, but players that haven't played under that sort of structure of last year. Maybe that could upset the apple cart a little bit and we could be very rusty at the start until... Well, I've got to say, I mean, I'm not trying to be callous, but um, Reed getting injured actually I think helps because... We don't play him? Yeah. He does look very slow now. To, very, very And we slow. talked about this during one of those preseason games, is I hope Buckley that doesn't default to the old guard just out of loyalty or investment that they're going to come good. Mm. You know, I, look, I, if Reed can, you know, come good and, you know, have a good run in the reserves and shows, you know, his forms up and all that, then fine, bring him in. Like, that's what I've always said, bring in guys who deserve it. But I was really worried that Buckley was going to go, all right, let's find a way to fit Reed into this four line with my check and... Cox and just I'm looking thinking that's going to be a really slow forward line you know so him being out allows them to stay largely with the structure they had last year which will be Myocek and Cox and then I mean Hoskin Elliott's not playing at the moment but no, the other guys around them away, yeah. yeah you know and then you inject Elliott who's yeah you got Steph that'll probably still play yep. up forward um, the well, Goey that'll be thereabouts in a week or two well you know you have that sort of forward line of Cox the Goey Beams. and Elliott but like those three in particular, like Beams is a good forward, but like the goalie's a scary forward. The goalie's the sort of guy who will just tear the game apart. Um, and then Elliot's exactly the same. And then you have Cox, and 
you know, what he did in the prelim, what he did in the second half of the grand final, he's shown he's, if the ball goes in his direction, you need to be a little bit worried. So they've got some players who are actually going to generate genuine fear in opposition. And hopefully that's going to help scatter the fences. Uh, and then you let your sort of guys who are a bit lesser known sneak in, you know, rove the crumbs. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see also how this 6-6-6 thing go as well in terms of you push that ball out quick to your runners. We can rebound and, and hopefully score pretty quick if that forward line functions as well as it has. Well, it's interesting in the, in the pre-season games that they were actually trying to... Um, expose that as much as they could by having their wingman play right at the point of the square so they could drop back into defence if required. Mm. But, you know, with the midfield we have with Grundy, you know, he's one of the best one of the best two ruckmen in the league. And on the other one? Yeah, yeah. that's it. Exactly. Um, and Carlton's going to pick you up with their priority pick. But with... You said pick then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With uh, Grundy there and then you have that midfield of Sidebottom and Pendlebury, Trelaw... Beams, then you're throwing guys like Adams, the goalie, and all that. You think, geez, sh- surely you should be dominating midfield clearances. You know, this is where you should be exposing that. Six, me six, personally, six. you personally should be exposing. I'll give it a try, coach. Put me out there. Put him out there, Bucks. So, um, tip. What do you think? I am going to tip Collingwood by twenty-seven points. Yeah, I'd say thirty-five. Okay. So, thanks for joining us for round one of the Collingwood Rant in 2019. If you like what you see, subscribe. Is it there somewhere? I don't know. So, okay. it's somewhere yeah. around there. 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 And if you have any comments, leave them here. And I believe we're up to about round three of last season answering the comments from that game. So, we'll get to any comments made this yeah, game. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah. Uh, and hit us up on, on Facebook if you want. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Later. Go Woods. I'll hit that one day.